speaker and I'm going to, thank you. Oops, got to hit that little got it button so I can continue to see everybody. Okay, da -da -da -da. Nicole is a certified nutrition and senior nutrition specialist living in the Northern Virginia area with her husband, Patrick, and two crazy cats, Fred and Wilma. I love it. I love it. She has made it her personal and professional mission to bridge the gap between reactionary and preventative senior care to help seniors age gracefully and healthily. Nicole focuses on chronic illness, prevention, and holistic care through nutrition, movement, and overall lifestyle. She understands firsthand the important and crucial role caregivers slash families play in the health and well-being of seniors. Why? Because her mom is the oldest of six siblings and a nurse. Nicole's mom was the caregiver of her mom and Nicole's grandmother before she passed away in a nursing home. You see, Nicole's grandmother was diabetic, diabetic, had her limbs amputated, and was fed the diabetic diet, which of course was riddled with carbohydrates. Nicole remembers her mom coming home from work angry at the way her mom was treated and how she was being fed. Nicole and her mom felt helpless. And that brings us to today, where her mom now, once again, is a caregiver for her grandfather. Nicole's mom lives in New Jersey and her grandfather in California. So mom is acting as a caregiver to her father across the country. Caregiving is hard enough, but doing it afar is even harder. Her grandfather keeps falling in and out of the hospital. He isn't eating properly and is beginning to have memory issues. Nicole's mom, who again is a nurse, knows how to care for her father, but doesn't know his nutritional needs because medical workers aren't provided education in nutrition. Sad but true. That is where Nicole fits in. She sees the struggle her mom is and is going through with her parents. <clears throat> Excuse me. And how she's ill-equipped, how she is ill-equipped with all the nutrition. She needs to know how to care for them nutritionally. Because of Nicole's personal experience of seeing her mom struggling to find the resources her parents need, she now knows more than ever how much of a need nutritional services are. So Nicole decided to put her education knowledge to use it to help not only her mom and family, but other caregivers and families better take care of their loved ones. She wants to equip them with the knowledge and tools needed to ensure they eat appropriately stay hydrated, and of course, minimize hospital visits. Let's all do this together and help our loved ones age more gracefully and healthily. Nicole, take it away. Well, thank you. That was, that was an awesome intro. I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> all right, let me just share my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Okay, cool. Um, so today uh, we're gonna talk about nutrition and aging. Specifically, I like to call it nutrition through the ages, essentially beginning at age 40 when the aging process actually begins um, through 65 plus. Um, so as Meryl uh, described or mentioned, uh, I'm Nicole Malone. Um, I'm the owner and CEO of Dark Horse Nutrition LLC. I am based in Reston, Virginia, but I provide services nationwide um, and throughout Northern Virginia and uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, if in-person services are required. Um, but 100% of my services can be delivered um, virtually. So I don't have to go through uh, about me because Meryl did a great job on introducing me, but um, I do hold a few certifications. Um, I am certified in uh, nutrition and exercise nutrition, as well as a senior, uh, a certified senior nutrition specialist, and uh, I'm certified in emotional eating psychology. So I try to cover the the whole gamut of of things that I notice um, plague, if you will, um, the everyday person. So I always like to start my presentations with a quote um, because I find this so relevant. So let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. Uh, nutrition is the most powerful medicine um, 
that we have, even more powerful than surgeries and medications and pills. Um, so many of our chronic issues that are plaguing um, the United States can be mitigated through uh, nutrition. So here are what I like to call the five pillars of healthy aging. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with these concepts. So we have cognitive stimulation, hydration, physical activity or movement, social stimulation, and, high, uh, and nutrition. Um, so all of these areas can actually, for the most part, uh, be touched on by uh, a nutrition specialist. Um, so of course we focus on movement. Now, basic movement, I'm not a, a physical therapist or personal trainer, but just any anything to get your body moving um, counts as physical activity or movement. Of course, nutrition to support healthy aging and the stage of life that the person's in. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, cognitive stimulation, of course, we have to keep the mind fresh, right? And these can be done through um, just standard education, like I'm doing for you all now, um, puzzles, um, just regular conversation even. Of course, hydration uh, is self-explanatory and then social stimulation. So these are the five basic pillars that I like to call the five pillars of healthy aging. So if we touch on all of these things with the seniors or the loved one, um, that will help um, immensely. All right, before we get to food examples, um, so nutrition or food for seniors uh, in nursing homes and other living communities is a major problem as evidenced by the 5.5 million seniors that are malnourished and the fact that fall death rates among seniors 65 and older have increased by 30% between 2009 and 2018. Every second of every day, an older adult suffers a fall, often resulting in hip fractures at the very least. Um, so as Meryl stated in my, uh, in my bio, um, the malnutrition is a huge issue. Um, you know, my grandmother and falls, now my grandfather. So this is a very, very huge issue with our senior population and our senior population is increasing. Um, so these problems are only gonna to continue to get worse um, unless we do something. And that's why I like to call the definition of insanity. You win the same things over and over and over again, expecting different results. Um, so these are just two of the major problems plaguing, plaguing our aging population today. Um, and as I said, it's only gonna get worse. And that brings us to the foods that we are serving our loved ones um, in nursing homes and these types of communities. Now, keep in mind the food you're gonna see, of course, I didn't pick the best foods, right? Um, of course, there are nursing homes and senior communities that do provide their seniors um, good quality foods, um, but the vast majority are all about the bottom line. They're all about the most cost effective. And you'll see evidence of that in some of these food examples. Um, so let's start talking about these foods. So this was one of the holiday meals. So you have whatever that gray thing is on top of that macaroni, you have broccoli and carrots. Um, so this is a plate riddled of carbs, right? And this would be okay for the diabetic diet because you're allowed to eat carbs, maybe not as much pasta, but everything else is okay on the diabetic diet. Um, so this is what our loved ones are being served. This looks pretty appetizing, right? It's very pleasing to the eye. And then you got some fruit here, a sandwich, some beans. So again, carb in the form of fiber, fruit, carb, sandwich, carb, Again, this looks very appetizing, right? So you have fruit and syrup, so sugar, more sugar, and more sugar. I don't know what this blob right here is, but I know these are sweet potatoes, rice. So again, carb, 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 carb. Again, pleasing to the eye, right? Beans and mashed potatoes, so carb, carb. Carbs, dessert, you have to have your dessert, right? 
So this is what our loved ones are being fed in these types of communities and nursing homes. Nothing but pure carbs, which are pure sugar, um, which I will talk a little bit more about um, later in the presentation. Um, but just know that as soon as food hits your tongue, the digestion starts, no matter what the carb source is, it turns into glucose, it turns into sugar. It doesn't matter if it's a potato, a green leafy vegetable or a fruit, it's all sugar. Um, fructose is different. So fruit is fructose and glucose, but all carbs have a glucose molecule. Um, fructose is digested and absorbed in the liver. And of course, glucose is sent to your bloodstream. So that's the only difference, but it's still all sugar. So here is why that is a huge problem. So here are just a couple examples of what happens through the aging process as you age. Again, these things can start as early as 40 and begin to accelerate um, at the age of 65, between 65 and 70. So you have decreased muscle mass and strength, which is known as sarcopenia. Um, you have a decreased immune competence. You have decreased calcium bioavailability, which means bioavailability, in case you don't know, essentially means uh, your body's ability to absorb the vast majority, the highest percentage of those types of foods. So we start losing the ability to absorb certain nutrients, um, decreased bone density, uh, and then here's more, uh, decreased vitamin absorption, um, detrimental oral changes. So your teeth, your oral health affects all of your health. Like your oral health is very, very important from head to toe. It affects all of this area here. So if you have really bad oral health, that is 100% going to affect other areas of your life. And not very many people realize that or understand that. So the state of your teeth and your gums and your tongue and everything in your health area is very important for your overall health. Um, of course, menopause, if you're a woman, because God hates us, us. but menopause, um, increased retention of vitamin A, decreased kidney ability to concentrate urine, um, slow gastric motility, decreased ability to regulate fluid balance, and this leads to dehydration. So as you see, there's a lot going on as you age, a lot on the biological and physiological level as we age. And it's that's why it's very important to supplement with nutrition and make sure you're supporting the aging process through nutrition because of all these things that are happening, the loss of the decreased ability, I shall say, uh, to absorb nutrients, your sarcopenia, your loss of muscle mass, your loss of bone, like all of those things are huge when it comes to falls, when it comes to your physical health and your overall health. So we need to support that with nutrition. And if you remember what they're being fed, these foods, now rhetorical question, do you think these foods are supporting that laundry list of things that change as you age? Hopefully you say absolutely not, because this is, that's really sad, the types of foods that they're being fed. And that's part of my mission is to change that and provide the education on what these seniors need to support all of these things that are happening. And you don't even realize are happening. You can't keep, you can't uh, drink enough. Your, your taste changes and you don't know why you're not eating. So this hopefully explains a little bit um, why those things are happening. So this is a lot, I know. Um, so what does all of this mean, this laundry list of changes mean when it comes to nutrition? Um, again, before I get into that, sarcopenia, again, is a loss of muscle strength or function. Um, that was the first thing on the list, and this is where it really starts, beginning at around 40-ish, um, but really starts to accelerate and progress at age 65. Um, so again, dietary intake is super important to support that. So now let's talk about our nutrition needs to support those things. Um, so as stated earlier, uh, malnutrition and falls um, are very, very uh, much a huge issue. So for the sake of time, 
those are the two areas that we're just going to focus on for this presentation, because as you see, there's a lot more that happens and we can be here for hours and hours and hours talking about how to support our loved ones through nutrition, but for the sake of time and understanding that malnutrition and falls are one of the top two major concerns right now. Those are the two things that this presentation is focused on. Um, so let's start with falls. Um, you may think that being frail as you age is normal, but it is not normal at all. And I hate that we have normalized it. Oh, it's just part of aging. Oh, that's normal. Falls are normal. Being frail is normal. That is not normal. It's 100% not normal. Being You should not be frail to the, to the point where, where you're falling constantly. That is not a normal part of the aging process. Fall and weaknesses are not normal. One of the most common and mo more known biological changes that occurs, again, beginning at 40 to 65, is sarcopenia, which I already talked about. Um, so sarcopenia is an age-related condition that has been related to, again, frailty, risk of falling, and decreased mobility in older adults. Because if you remember, that's the loss of muscle and muscle mass. Um, the results of progressive sarcopenia can be costly with hospitalizations and rehabilitation, which again, that's what we're going through with my grandfather. Um, but this doesn't have to be an issue, or at the very least, this process can be slowed through dietary changes. Um, so dietary intake is super important when it comes to sarcopenia prevention, um, as far as the loss of muscle and muscle mass, as well as bone density. Um, so protein needs. So this is where protein comes in. So protein is critical for stimulating protein synthesis, which essentially is just the creation of proteins by cells that use things like DNA and RNA, as well as various enzymes, um, and for suppressing protein degradation. Um, however, this process may be blunted in older adults, meaning this process is harder for older adults. It doesn't really happen as it does in someone my age in their early 40s. Um, therefore, inadequate protein intake or even current protein recommendations for older adults may, be, uh, may result in reduced muscle mass. So let's talk about the protein needs in older adults. So the protein intake in 65 and older adults actually needs to be increased, not decreased, um, to support the aging process. So for instance, someone between the ages of 18 to 64, the recommended intake is between 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram of body weight, not per pound, per kilogram of body weight. And you'll notice in adults 65 and older, the protein recommendation increases to one to 1.5 grams uh, per kilogram of body weight daily. Um, so I'm sure you understand now why seniors require more protein because of the loss of muscle, the loss of bone density, uh, their lack of ability to absorb vitamins and nutrients, which they get in animal products, which I will talk about um, a little bit more of the types of foods that they should be eating um, once we get to malnutrition. So malnutrition is essentially an inadequate intake of protein and other essential nutrients, generally resulting in starvation or significantly reduced intake. Um, so I'm sure many of you experience this in your loved ones or maybe senior parents experience this with their parents, such as I'm going through now, they can't get their parent to eat or you can't get your parent to eat um, no matter what you do. And that's likely why they're being fed the foods that they're being fed because they may taste good and they just want to get them to eat. Um, so part of the aging process as a review is the loss of ability to absorb a vast majority of the nutrients, the vitamins and minerals from foods. You start to lose your sense of smell, which affects your sense of taste. Your taste buds start to decrease. So there's a number of things that are happening that contribute to malnutrition um, that happen biologically and normal through the aging process. So this is important to understand that these things are happening, but it's also important to understand that doesn't give 
whoever is caring for them permission to feed them a plate full of carbohydrates because that's not what's best for their overall health through the aging process. Um, so malnutrition can also occur with improper absorption of protein and vitamins and minerals, which I stated earlier. Um, no, uh, nutrient absorption becomes more difficult with age. So the Academy of the Academy and American Society for per, uh, Parenteral and, and Enteral Nutrition um, suggest diagnosing malnutrition by two or more of the following characteristics. And they're listed here on the screen. So things like um, inadequate energy intake, as you age 65 and older, your energy intake, meaning the food that you take in, actually needs to decrease because you're not as active as you once were. Now, there are older adults who are very active, who can probably outrun me, but the vast majority of people aren't as active as they were in their 20s, 30s, 40s. They start to slow down. Their metabolism starts to slow down. So in order to prevent unnecessary weight gain, their intake of appropriate foods, which I'll talk about in a minute, needs to decrease a little bit because they're not as active and their metabolism isn't as fast. Um, weight loss also also occurs, which contributes to the older adult being frail and falling and taking longer to recover. Um, again, the loss of muscle mass. I'm going to keep hitting on that because that's a huge, huge, huge problem in our older population, um, specifically because of the way they're, they're being fed and the way they're eating. Um, the loss of subcutaneous fat, localized generalized fluid accumulation, declining functional status as measured by hand grip strength. So again, they start to lose strength because of the loss of muscle mass. So there are many factors that contribute to malnutrition in seniors, uh, including loss of appetite, lack of ability to chew and swallow, uh, decreased sense of smell, increased use of prescription medications, which actually isn't thought of, um, a lot. So as you age, you, you tend to see your prescription medications increase. Um, that's not a normal thing either. My dad's on a slew of, of pills and that's not, that's not normal. Um, and that shouldn't be normalized. Um, and so much more. Um, it is important to note that dehydration is a huge issue as well with our aging population. Um, but again, to save time, just know that one of the contributing factors is decreased sense of thirst. So you know how you are able to recognize when you're thirsty or sometimes you can, you can get confused between hunger and thirst because you waited too long to eat. You just, your brain and your stomach just knows you need something, it's empty and you don't know whether you need fluids or food. Well, that gets even more confusing for the older adults. Um, they start to lose their ability to recognize those signals and those things that their bodies are sending them. So that's part of the reason why they're, they have trouble drinking fluids and they're dehydrated. And that's likely why they have an easier time drinking things like chocolate milk and soda and things like that. Because again, they have decreased sense of smell and taste and appetite and those things taste good. And they just, people just want to make sure that they're eating and drinking. Um, but just know that they do start to lose the sense of thirst and that's likely what leads to, uh, dehydration. So giving them soda is not going to help with dehydration because that's going to further their dehydration. So it may taste good. Um, but we need to make sure that they're drinking plenty of water. Um, so malnutrition, uh, while difficult to navigate, there are things that can be done to break down the barrier, of course, to get your loved ones to eat. So before I talk about um, the things that can be done outside of food, let's talk about the food. So here is a list of recommended proteins because again, protein is very, very important when it comes to the aging process, especially the loss of muscle mass, uh, bone density, strength. So eggs are a great source of nutrition, even the yolk for those who, you know, remember the seventies and eighties where we were demonizing fat and especially the yolks, even the yolk, that's where all the nutrition is. Um, beef, poultry, 
um, fish, lean and fatty, uh, dairy, and in a pinch, uh, whey protein powder. So if you are going to, you know, give your loved one a smoothie or something um, out of all the protein powders that are out there, whey protein powder is the best one. So I would recommend staying away from soy and plant-based protein powders. So on a, on a quick high level, when it comes to bioavailability, which we now know is what we as humans absorb the highest percentage of, that's what bioavailability means. Bioavailability, um, when it comes to bioavailability, the foods that are most bioavailable to us humans are animal-based foods. They Nicole, are- Nicole, I have a question. Okay. Um, when it comes to eggs, are the egg yeah. whites considered part of the protein or- yeah, right. so the egg whites are pretty much where all the protein is, and the egg yolks are where the um, dietary cholesterol and uh, the other vitamins and minerals are. And I'll touch on fat a little bit um, okay. Okay. in here, but yeah, the whole egg is ideal because if you just eat the yolk, you're missing out on the other nutrients of the egg. All of the nutrients outside of the protein are, are contained in the actual yolk. Well, I can't eat egg yolks. I can eat egg whites. That's why I was wondering. Oh yeah, you can get those uh, same nutrients from from beef as well, um, and that's what I was getting at with the bioavailability. So this may answer your question. Um, let me just make sure I don't talk. Okay. Um, so when it comes to bioavailability of foods that we as humans can absorb the highest percentage of, and they are complete uh, chains of amino acids which is what our body converts proteins to, and fatty acids, which of course is what we convert fat into, omega-3s and omega-6s, um, are from animal foods. So you're thinking things like things that are listed here on the screen. So the eggs, beef, poultry, fish, dairy, full fat dairy. And that's why I recommend whey protein if you're going to use whey protein because that is uh, animal-based protein and that has more of a complete chain amino acid. So super quick, let me just explain that a little bit because that's not in this presentation, but I think it's important for you to know. Um, I don't wanna get too far in the weeds and make this super confusing, uh, but I can geek out on nutrition all day long. Um, but when it comes to uh, full pro, uh, pro, uh, nutrient profiles, so protein, we hit on protein a lot. We hit on the importance of protein a lot in this presentation when we're talking about malnutrition and falls because of the, to support the aging process. So let me start with proteins. So proteins, our body converts proteins to amino acids. There are a slew of amino acids on, on the chain. When it comes to complete chain amino acids, like you're not missing any nutrient, you get those from animal foods. When you're talking things like plant-based foods, like beans, legumes, fruits, vegetables, all those things, you are missing amino acid chains. You are not getting a complete nutrition profile. There's other issues with those foods I'm not gonna get into now, but just know that you're not getting a complete nutrition profile. In order to get a complete nutrition profile from non-animal sources, you have to be a mad scientist and mix and match your foods perfectly, like beans with soy products or whatever to get complete amino acids. You need to be a mad scientist and know exactly what plant foods to pair together to get that complete chain amino acids. And let me tell you, 99.9% .9 of people don't know how to do that and aren't doing that. So they're they're likely malnourished um, and don't even know it. And that's why they have to supplement a lot. Um, fat is not in this presentation, but I will say fat, although demonized, that's important as well, because when the senior loses the ability to absorb nutrients and vitamins and minerals, micronutrients, can, getting those in plants and fruits can lead to other issues. If you haven't heard of lectins and oxalates and phytonutrients and all those, I would look those up um, when you get a chance and look at what oxalates are, what lectins are, um, and what phytonutrients are. We call them anti-nutrients. So that's not going to support the older adult, especially because they're already starting to get gastrointestinal issues, already starting to get digestion issues. 
Um, so your body is fighting against those anti-nutrients. So they're not absorbing a lot of those vitamins and minerals in those foods. So because the older adult already has an issue with vitamin absorption, I recommend getting those vitamins and neutral nutrients from things like proteins and fats. You can get a hundred percent of your vitamins and minerals from beef alone. Um, shocking. I know, but you can get everything your body needs from just eating beef. Um, so I would recommend from a nutritional standpoint, don't subtract things out of their diet. Absolutely not. I don't believe in subtracting, add things in. So if they want to eat a plate full of um, sweet potatoes and rice and green beans and whatever, cool. Add in a lean chicken breast, add in some eggs, add in some fish. So don't take things away, add things in that supports their aging process. So allow them to keep eating the foods they love because you're not going to change an 85, 90 year old. Uh, you're not going to change them. So don't take things out of their diet, but try to focus more on these foods in addition to the types of foods they enjoy eating. Um, so other things to try. So malnutrition, of course, is a huge issue. And I know my mom struggled with it. And a lot of, you know, caregivers struggle with how do I get there? How do I get my parent to eat? So here's just some things to try. So maybe try smaller meals. Um, smaller meals may, may be less overwhelming and more manageable for them. Giving them a full course meal in one meal may be overwhelming for them and they may not be able to get it all in because remember their appetites decreased, their uh, digestion and ability to absorb is decreased. So they may physically be unable to eat larger meals. So maybe try smaller meals. Um, Strive for more nutritious foods, like I just mentioned earlier, but um, try things like a savory chili, try things like um, soups and stews because they're very flavorful, but you can put all of the nutrients that they need in one big pot um, and pack it with flavors, whether it's with seasoning or things like parsley or whatever the case may be. Um, packing foods with a lot of flavor will stimulate their, their appetite and, and make them want to eat the food foods. So the chili recipe I like is I pack my uh, frog pot with a ton of ground beef, uh, full fat cream cheese, bone broth, uh, diced tomatoes and tomato paste. I promise you it is the most savory chili I've ever eaten. My husband even likes it. Um, physical activity, again, one of the five pillars. Um, physical activity, no matter what it is, whether it's walking, whether it's um, standing up and down, doing doing some air squats as low as they can go safely, um, will stimulate appetite. This doesn't have to be hours in the gym or they don't need to break a sweat, they just need to get moving. Um, so physical activity can stimulate appetite. It increases food intake and it increases energy. So maybe do things like create a walking group, which would be the social aspect of the five pillars to promote exercise and socialization at the same time. Um, the key when it comes to malnutrition is to make meals more manageable, fun, and of course, add more protein and other nutritious um, foods and don't subtract things from their diet. That just adds to the stress and the problem. So I don't know how much time I have left. Um, what was that? You can keep going. Uh, it's only 9.16. We can go, you know, our, our limit is 10 o'clock because we want to, re <clears throat> excuse me, respect everybody's time. And we yeah, have before, time for questions and answers. Yep. Um, before I talk about um, essential nutrients, which, which wasn't on here, um, I didn't know how quickly I was going to get through this. Are there any questions over anything that was contained in the presentation or anything I talked about so far. I believe Judy Tiger had a question. She had put it in the uh, chat. So Judy, if you want to unmute yourself. Oh, I was just asking about the other kinds of meat. Oh, Man yeah. And um, pork. Yep. Yep. So all, all animal foods. Um, so uh, beef, poultry, so chicken, uh, lamb, pork, um, bison, game meat, other game meats. Um, 
when it comes to fish, you can do the do the lean fish for sure if they don't like fatty fish, like things like um, cod, uh, salmon, tuna, um, mackerel, sardines are gross, but if you like sardines, <laughs> um, things like that, um, even flounder, the bottom feeders. Um, yeah. So but any sort of what what do you mean if they don't like fatty fish? What is the like people... salmon, salmon to fatty fish. I don't like fatty fish, for instance. I oh, like okay. white, white, lean fish. So if okay. if you're right. like me and don't like like things like salmon or the tuna or things like that, then you can go for the leaner, like the white fish. Um, but it, tuna it ha- fishes are perfectly nutritious, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why they were on the list. They're very, very oh, good right. in, in omega yeah, threes. They're on the list. Yeah, yeah, they're good in omega threes. And since yeah. we have time, I was going to talk a little bit more about. Um, essential nutrients that uh, apply for the older, it applies for everyone, no matter what your age is. So you guys can benefit from this as well. But when I talk about the essential nutrients, I'll touch on the omega threes and right. omega sixes as well. But yeah, if they don't like fatty fish, then any white fish or lean fish is fine. Becca has a question. Her hand is up. Hi. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, I think you kind of touched on this. I was going to ask, what would you say to a vegan or a vegetarian? But you mentioned if you're going to eat beans, you have to mix it with other certain foods in order to make it a complete. Yeah. Um, So this response isn't meant to be funny, but it's probably going to come across funny. But what I would say to a vegan or vegetarian, a plant-based dieter is don't do it. Um, Like, stop it's not recommended so any diet that requires supplementation is not healthy you're also not getting heme iron which is important for for your blood health and your cell health you can only get that from meat you cannot get that from a plant-based diet so even pills even over-the-counter pills are not heme iron so there's non-heme iron which you get from plants and heme iron which you get from beef so the problem with the plant-based diet which I'll touch on a little bit more and when I talk about essential nutrients is that you're not getting complete fatty acids, you're not getting complete proteins, and there's a lot of what we like to call anti-nutrients in those foods, specifically lectins and oxalates, which are the two that causes a ton of issues. Oxalates are actually the most common form of kidney stone. Um, those are the calcium stones. So if you know of anyone who struggles with kidney stones and your doctor says it's a calcium buildup, it's a calcium buildup from oxalates, which are in those plant foods. Um, So that's pretty much what I would say to vegans is don't because you're malnourishing yourself and you're missing out on nutrients. You may think you're healthy. You may feel that you're healthy, but you're, you're really, really not. And it'll catch up to you over the, over the years. There is an 85% drop-off rate from plant-based dieters because of that. It does eventually start to affect your health. I was a vegan for four years and I got off of it. I I was one of those vegan failures um, because I just didn't feel good. But um, I'll talk a little bit more about that on the essential uh, nutrient part. Okay. And then just one more question. Um, You, I think you mentioned that loss of, loss of taste and smell, Mm -hmm. um, can lead to malnutrition. Yep. What can you do to battle against that? Yeah, so as I mentioned for um, like the things like the chilies and the stews is to pack the foods with flavors. So if they, if you struggle getting your loved one to eat like a regular plate of food like you and I would eat, maybe try the chilies, the stews, the soups, and pack it with flavor. That's why a lot of older adults have an easy time eating ice cream and the junky food, and that's likely why they're being fed the way they're fed in those homes, because they're more flavorful than a piece of chicken breast or a piece of steak at that point. Um, So the key is to just pack your foods with flavor. Maybe try the chilies, the stews, the soups, Um, that might be a good option, uh, a flavorful option, and they're getting their right nutrition at the same time. Thank you. Sure. Kitchi. Hello. Um, I just have a question for, um, so first, um, I do believe that uh, it's better not to limit what you eat or not do a vegan or I always believe that a well-balanced diet is still uh, your best bet. However, 
I think one of the issues with food, especially if you're living alone, and we have a lot of seniors who are like that, is the cost, which is the reason why you have plans like Medicare Advantage, they start to include the food, so uh, the groceries, and they are allowed to shop for ones that um, will contribute better to their health, not just any food. So um, I just want to know what are your, uh, what can you say about that? Uh, how is it? because it's one of the challenges and, yeah. you know, so it's important to, to consider the cost and mm -hmm. still get the good nutrients and be healthy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I don't, I don't claim to have all of, all of the answers for these things because there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into it and there's a lot of factors. Um, so I don't want to pretend I have all the answers for everything, but I will say that um, I understand the cost because I went to go get two chicken breasts and it was $24 and I said, heck no. Um, so everything's expensive. So I get it. Um, there are ways where you can do those things, kind of like the supplementation, the protein powder I mentioned. You can also get canned tuna, canned fish, which those aren't idea ideal, but they're better than the ultra processed meats and the ultra processed packaged foods. So you can get the canned chicken, the canned tuna and things like that. If you're in a pinch, you can get, um, you can get ground beef is I bought ground beef earlier this week and it was like five bucks. Um, so you can get foods that aren't so expensive. Plus those types of foods like a ground beef are so filling and so satiating that that one pound of ground beef will likely leave uh, last the senior who doesn't eat as much as you and I would eat, last them a few days, especially if you make a chili, a, a soup or a stew with it. So there are ways around it that you can get the less expensive meats um, and not maybe get, you know, a, a sirloin steak or whatever, but you can get a four or five dollar pound of, of ground beef, which I think is reasonably um, priced in a grocery store. But not the $24 two chicken breasts is not reasonably priced. <laughs> I'm just curious, where did you see the $24 chicken breast? Harris Teeter here in Ruston. Oh, yeah. okay. It's insane. I noticed that Trader Joe's got good prices. Um, yeah. but at the same time, also what I try to do, because there's only three of us in our family, um, you know, is, uh, use a freezer to, yeah. to freeze food. So thank you. Yeah. You can also, yeah, you can shop around like Walmart. If you have a, a Walmart with, or a target with the, um, with that sells food groceries, um, they're usually more reasonably priced than regular grocery stores. You can buy in bulk at Costco or Sam's if you have a membership. So there are ways to buy food in bulk to make it last um, longer. But if you really are in a pinch pinch and, and really can't afford those things all the time, then yeah, I would say that's when getting canned stuff or even avocados or whatever would be, would be okay for the protein portion. Nicole, um, I yes. just want to make a comment because I have always felt, and even to this day, I need protein in my diet. I can't function unless I have a good solid piece of protein, uh, mm -hmm. chicken, fish, whatever. <clears throat> and sometimes I'm disappointed when I go into restaurants, you know, and I <laughs> order a, a nice dinner, you know, and I love salmon. I am one of the few who absolutely love salmon. I'm disappointed because there's not enough protein in the meal. And also being somebody who used to, um, I was a tennis player, I was a runner, you know, I knew, you know, what I needed to keep myself going. And the old adage of you are what you eat is so true. And I think you're just verifying that. And um, thank you very much. And you know, I also see what goes on, you know, with the senior communities. And uh, I I have heard where, you know, in where seniors where, you know, they they get eggs for breakfast and they get chocolate syrup put on it. I can't validate yeah. putting the chocolate syrup on on eggs. I, I just can't, but that's a personal opinion. 
Yeah, that sounds gross. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I did, I did mention that. Yeah, there are communities that actually do feed feed their their seniors well. Of course, I'm not going to pick those foods to for this presentation. I'm going to pick the worst foods that I saw. Um, but it's not all of them. But my grandmother, who was diabetic, and this is going to be against the grain, and this stirs up a lot of good, healthy conversation. Um, I'm one of those nutrition specialists, and there's more and more like me um, starting to come out, even registered dietitians and primary care physicians who are anti-dietary recommendations. Because if my grandmother wasn't fed the diabetic diet with all those carbs, because remember, they're all sugar, and I'm going to get, since we have a little bit more time, I'll talk about that. Because I think it'll be important for you guys to understand <laughs> when it comes to essential nutrients, um, she would probably still be alive today. And that really, really angers and frustrates me. Um, so when it comes to essential nutrients, there are four macronutrients. Alcohol is a macronutrient. I call it the redheaded stepchild. It's kind of a macronutrient of, and it's of an, of itself. Um, but there are four, you have proteins, fats, carbs, and alcohol, um, essential nutrient when it comes to nutrition means that your body needs to get those your, your body needs to get those nutrients from food. Your body cannot produce its own nutrients. It needs to derive it from food. So that's what essential means when it comes to nutrition. So out of those four macronutrients, carbs are very complicated. Uh, and this is where against the grain and probably stirring a little bit of debate, even on this call, it started a little debate yesterday on my presentation. So maybe it'll start a little debate here. Um, it gets complicated because there are a lot of carb sources, fruits and vegetables are technically a carb, but people don't think of those as carbs. They think of them as fruits and vegetables, but those are carbs. Then you have fiber, a carb, table sugar, a carb, starches, a carb, right? So you have your grains, your fruits and vegetables, your potatoes, um, all those things are, are carb sources. And then you have alcohol, which your body treats as a toxin and gets rid of it right away. That's what it means when you open up the, the pipes when you're, when you're drinking alcohol and you constantly have to go to the bathroom. That's your kidneys ridding your body of, of the toxins that is alcohol. Um, so those are the ways that we excrete waste, urine and number two, right? So out of those four macronutrients, the two macronutrients that are not essential, meaning we do not need, our body does not need those substances is alcohol, of course, it's a toxin, um, and carbs. Our body produces its own glucose. The problem with eating those types of foods that are being fed to our seniors, um, all of these foods that are riddled with carbs is they go with the exception of fruit, because fruit is fructose and glucose and fructose is processed in the liver. And that can contribute to non-alcohol fatty liver over time. But when it comes to regular carb sources, non-fruit, it's right into your bloodstream, right? It's converted to glucose. It does not matter if it's a broccoli, a carrot and pasta, it doesn't matter, it's glucose. What happens is to control that insulin is released that's what controls your blood sugar. So when you get diabetes, it's not an insulin issue. It's a blood sugar issue. It's the excess carbs causes diabetes and the insulin response has to continually being released to draw your blood sugar down. So what happens is your body can only store a certain amount of glucose at one time. And your, your insulin is what brings that excess glucose to storage. Once there's no storage left, there's no more room at the end your insulin has to bring the glucose somewhere. Where do you think the insulin brings the glucose? To your fat cells. And that's what promotes fat storage. Um, so our bodies can only handle a certain amount of glucose. Our blood can only handle a certain amount of glucose at one time. And our body produces its own in the liver called gluconeogenesis. So our body self-regulates glucose the problem is if you're eating all of those carbs, you're throwing everything out of whack. So that leads me to fat. 
Fat is an essential nutrient. We, we cannot produce our own fatty acids. We cannot produce our own omega-3s. Um, we need to get those things from food, primarily from animal foods is preferred. Our brains are 65 to 70% fat in the form of cholesterol. Our cells are fat. Our cell linings are cholesterol. Our organs function off fat. The portion of the brain that needs glucose our body produces just enough glucose on its own to fuel the brain and the other organs that need glucose. Um, and then protein. We can't make our own amino acids. We need to get those things from food, preferably animal sources. Um, so that's why I say what I said about carbs is because eating the amount of carbs we're eating leads to a lot of issues because our diet should actually be reversed. We should be eating more protein and fat and less carbs to support proper brain and organ function. And this last point I'll make about fiber, you don't need fiber to go number two. I have perfectly fine bowel movements and I'm extremely low carb. Um, but the problem with fiber, and this goes against the common belief, but there's research and, and stuff out there that shows this, but the problem with fiber is it causes bulky stool because we can't digest or absorb fiber at all, especially grains are the worst. That causes a lot of inflammation, but it causes a backup in your digestive tract. And once fiber hits your large intestines, it's still intact. And that bulk is what is in your stool. And it's painful and it leads to constipation and other issues. Um, so that's why, especially in adults 65 and older, I recommend higher protein and fat and less of those sugary foods in the form of carbs. Because remember, all carbs are sugar. It's all glucose. It doesn't matter the source. Um, and, and fiber, because they already have digestive issues. They likely already have osteoarthritis or arthritis. They already have infl infl uh, inflammatory issues. They have issues digesting and absorbing food. There's a lot of things going on. So keep feeding them the carbs and the things that are not essential to us as humans is only adding to the problem. So I just suggest flipping that upside down. And I promise you, it would be so beneficial and they will feel so much better. And maybe even those chronic issues that they're experiencing may start to minimize. Um, they'll definitely get stronger and hopefully fall less um, 100%. And, they'll, and that'll help with their malnutrition as well, uh, because they'll be able to absorb more of those nutrients from those types of foods. Um, so that was just what I wanted to go over a little bit here at the end. But did that answer some of the questions that were asked earlier about you know, the fat and, and the protein and, and all of that. Hi, Gigi. Hello. I just, um, you know, with, while listening to what you say and thinking about other factors uh, that contributes to the health of the seniors, and I, I just can't help um, but realize that aside you know from the nutrition of course there are other factors like what you said earlier are they been moving around you know um but i can't you know i keep on gravitating with the cost because i shop around for my family i buy food and um i'll be honest you know i still try and understand uh why is it cheaper to buy a hamburger than it is to buy a salad with some meat in other words you know the food that are healthy or to to get the cost is a little bit high, which I was wondering if maybe that's the reason why in senior care facilities, that's the food that was served. And, you know, someone is running a business and other factors are, you know, what are the seniors been asking for? So, and sometimes it's not necessarily healthy when they make, they make their food choices, which is why it's good that you are offering such um, education. Um, but overall, I just thought about that and I just uh, want to share that the challenge is the struggle is real when it comes yeah. to balancing the cost and um, eating healthy. Like I said, uh, sometimes um, my husband would ask me, where do you want to go to eat? And to be honest, you know, I find a lot 
the uh, final lot of choices with Asian food, such as Vietnamese and Japanese to be healthy. But, you know, between the two, it's cheaper to eat in a Vietnamese restaurant and the Japanese would be like, oh, let's check that price, you know? Yeah. And, um, but thinking of that, you know, so if that's not the choice, what are the other choices? The other choices now are fast foods. So um, with that in mind, you know, it's it's a bit expensive to 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 stay healthy and it requires more creativity. And um, so I would suggest really that you offer a lot of education, especially on that area to help people um, eat better, but at the same time, uh, affordable. But thank you for your presentation. Yeah, that's a fair point, like eating eating on a budget. Um, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a huge issue. I have a couple clients who are struggling with that now also. Um, I will say that you're right. The seniors are provided, uh, I think two meal options in a lot of communities, two different meals, and they have the ability to choose their meals. Um, but if you put like uh, the average person, if you put, um, chicken nuggets and fries or, um, grilled chicken and broccoli in front of them and they have the choice I bet you more often than not most people are going to choose the the cheeseburger and or chicken nuggets and fries um so they want what's flavorful um I will say my opinion on why those more processed foods are are more affordable is because if you understand what processed foods are and how they're made. So I like to use the example of the potato. So if you buy a whole potato, it's one ingredient. Um, it's literally just the potato. And it's literally from someone's farm to the grocery store, um, hopefully not injected with a bunch of stuff. Um, but then if you talk box potatoes, box mashed potatoes that you will get at the grocery store, um, it's, a, it's a ton of ingredients, but the whole potato compared to the boxed mashed potatoes, you'll notice that the sodium, the sugar, uh, the sodium and the sugar specifically, the content has tripled, if not quadrupled, because what they do is they strip the nutrients out of the potato during the processing stage and jack up the sodium and the sugar. And this comes to all processed foods, all ultra processed box foods, this applies. Beef jerky as well, unless, it's like literally homemade in someone's kitchen and not ultra processed in a lab, but all ultra processed foods are stripped of the vast majority of their nutrients and jacked with sodium and sugar, like fillers. That's, that's what drives a cost down because it's not, it's mostly factory made and, and modified and added with a lot of fillers. It's not just a whole potato. So that's how they get away with jacking the price down because you're not working with a whole ingredient. They're adding a bunch of cheap ingredients in there to make it more flavorful. So that's just my opinion on why the cost may be the way they are based off how I know ultra processed foods are manufactured. Um, so that, that might be a reason if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca. Thank you for the presentation. That was really fantastic uh, information. I have two questions. One, do you do one-on-one -on -one meetings with, se with a senior, like a Zoom call to, to answer their questions and educate them like this? Yeah, so I offer, um, I offer um, consultations to uh, a lot of uh, home care and um, senior communities, um, as well as the seniors themselves. I do offer consultations. I also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching um, okay. for individuals. Um, I did just start a family caregiver program, uh, group coaching. Mm -hmm. So to help people like my mom and maybe some people on the call who are caregivers themselves uh, or know someone who are, it's kind of a two for one, I call it. So I help the caregiver care for themselves because you know, they're not caring for themselves, mm -hmm. but act more as a consultant for them to help guide them through the nutritional needs of their, of their loved one. Um, so I try to offer a variety of things to try to help in a number of areas the best I can. Um, mm -hmm. but I do try to customize and customize my offerings based off of, off of the needs. Okay. 
So how, how would someone schedule that? Would they just call you or is there something on your website? Yeah, there's a link on my website to, to book a, book a call with me. Um, okay. Yeah. So they can just go to my website or my email address and my phone number, I believe are on there as well. So they can just send me an email or, or text. Okay. Thank you. Can you yeah, put no, your you. information in the chat also, your communication information? That would be great. Sure. Now, we've also had a request, and I'm interested too. Are you willing to share your slides? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can send them. I can email you the slides. Okay, that would be fine. And yeah. I'll I'll send them out to only those who have been on the call. Okay, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, was that, were there any more... Uh, any more questions or anything else you want me to discuss uh, a little further? Um, I'm fine. Uh, I don't see any other hands okay. up. I just know you've made an absolutely fabulous presentation. And as far as I'm concerned, you have verified some of the thoughts that I have uh, possessed in my brain all along. And I know there are people when I say you need more protein, they look at me as if I'm nuts. <laughs> You know, and, Nicole, uh, I have a question when when Meryl's done. Go ahead, Rebecca. I'm um, basically done. OK, um, back to the question about vegans and, and vegetarians. Um, how do you convince them? Oh, to, man. <laughs> I mean, they've been doing this for, you know, 20, 30 years or more. I mean, how do you get through to them? Uh, the good news is, like I mentioned earlier, there's an 85% drop off rate. So eventually they'll, they'll come to the, they'll come to my side, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't try to convince people to eat a certain way. Honestly, I just provide the education and just help people make a more informed decision. Um, until they start experiencing health issues, for instance, I have a client who was plant-based before working with me, predominantly plant-based, um, she had kidney stones and she was getting them off and on. She actually had a one had one surgically removed. Thankfully, her doctor, because not a lot of doctors are educated in this. Um, thankfully, her doctor said it's from the oxalates in plants. Um, so he kind of agreed with me and now she's eating more animal foods. Um, so until they have a health issue, the problem is, is we've normalized digestive issues, bloating, inflammation, and all that. We've normalized it um, to where we don't contribute those things to food, unfortunately. We just think it's normal. Oh, I'm constipated, whatever, it'll go away. Like everything's so normalized that those things are not normal at all. And you should not be feeling that way. I didn't know I was constipated until I went low carb. I didn't know I had digestive issues. I was like, holy crap, I feel amazing. I had no idea. So until they experience health issues, then they're not going to start questioning things. But eventually, I think they'll start, it'll catch up to them, and then they'll they'll fall off. But I don't make it my job to convince people to eat a certain way. I don't try to get people to eat the way I do, because it's not for everyone. And I don't feel it's my job to do that. I just educate and hopefully they'll make better decisions. Um, the problem is there's a lot of bad information on on the internet, especially research but if you actually look at the research most of it in human nutrition is epidemiological which means it's observation like nicole what did you eat this month and i just give the science scientists a list of what i ate that month but they're not comparing apples and apples if you actually read the studies that you're looking at online from top to bottom you'll realize one who it's funded by and what they're actually comparing. There's no studies out there that compare plant-based diets to animal-based diets. There are zero studies that are out there that compare apples to apples. It's comparing one extreme to slightly worse. And that's why the studies are the way they are. There's a lot of information out there that says you need fiber to go to the bathroom. There's benefits of fiber, but you don't digest or absorb it. And if you eat too much fiber, it could be toxic. Um, so there's a lot of bad and conflicting information out there. So it's kind of hard to talk about animal-based diets and low-carb diets when there's so much stuff out there 
about plants and things that don't benefit us. But if you go to botany that actually studies plants, um, it's not, you're not going to find it in human nutrition, but if you go and do research on plants there, I think the WHO also has a list of all the toxins, the biochemicals, the defense chemicals found in plants. You're not going to find that in human nutrition studies. You're going to find that in plant studies. And that's the problem. It's all the information isn't in one place. It's scattered all over the place. And if you don't know what's there, you don't know to look for it. Yeah. Logan, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I wanted to just mention um, for me personally, and I want to get your thoughts on this, Nicole, the number one most important piece of food that I added to my diet, which is illegal to buy, is raw butter. Um, mm -hmm. I get it illegally from an Amish farm because it's not legal to buy it. Um, but I've just found that by adding truly raw butter, not just real butter, but truly raw, which you cannot legally buy. Um, I found that to be an enormous help just across the board. It's, you know, I don't want to say it's a panacea, but if there's one thing, one thing I would recommend everybody add to their diet, it's raw butter and you cannot legally buy it. Yeah, you can't buy raw milk in a lot of places either. Um, the problem is with our milk, it's all pasteurized and we've lost the ability to uh, digest lactose or a lot of people have, like I still have lact the lactase enzyme. I'm not affected by it, but most people we've evolved and that genetic ability to digest uh, lactose has fallen off for the most part. Um, so the problem is, is a lot of our butters, people are buying margarine anyway, the vast majority of people, and that's riddled with seed oils and all sorts of garbage, S whole stick butters. Uh, and even raw milk are the best because it's not, nothing's added to them. Um, it's, it's literally fresh from teat to glass. Um, it's, it's as fresh as you can get with no additives and, and nothing, nothing that can adversely affect your health. But since we can't get raw milk or raw butter, just sticks of butter are better than margarine. Whole milk is better than skim milk or almond milk or any of those alternatives. Um, so if you are in a state where most of us are that you can't get raw foods like that, then the actual whole milk uh, is better than skim milk and the nut milks and sticks of butter are way better than margarine. Plus it just tastes better. Like raw butter and raw milk tastes way better. And you realize that, you know, we have this prejudice that if it tastes good, it must be bad for you. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like the opposite of reality. <laughs> so, yeah. I, but if I, you can, if you can, raw butter, raw dairy, good stuff. I was, I was in Georgia where you could buy raw milk legally uh, for pet consumption and then you could churn your own butter and that's how you could, you could do it. But I just, yeah. I just get it from an Amish farm illegally because yeah. You mean legally? <laughs> Morally, I do Don't admit to crime. <laughs> I I just wanted to uh, a follow up on Rebecca's question regarding the vegan. I just noticed that some people become vegan, uh, and I think I I do agree. It's really complicated. I meet them, and I do understand that you know it. Uh, there are certain impacts on health, but. Um, and the complexity is coming from the sometimes the choice is driven by um, ethical some ethical and social issues, sure. especially if they are uh, they are they care so much from the pet to the point that the pet becomes more important than humans. Sometimes it's to the extreme, and so they become vegan because they don't want to eat animals because they care so much about pet or 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 animals, or in that sense, or various issues, some of them are more, and you can notice also what their political leanings are, and or anything, you know, social issues, and sometimes people promote social issues, um, not because they're strongly advocating for it, but sometimes they're using it to to make a name, to align to their business. And so they become, uh, so people would buy for them or something. So I thought that was really complex, so. Yeah, so I don't want, yeah, this is a touchy subject. So you can live, the average family can live nose to tail on one cow for an entire year or more. Um, there are more animals killed 
um, getting foods for the vegan diet than animal-based diets. There are, and this saddens me, and this is this is probably not going to sit well, but it's a God's honest truth, and it made me cry. A lot of farmers, to protect their crops, will have snipers that go out in the middle of the night and shoot and kill hogs and whatever animals that are eating their crops to protect their crops. Those big machinery, the farm machinery, kill so many farm rodents, rats, and all these things. M millions of farm animals are killed uh, farming and getting foods for the plant-based diet. Um, then animal-based diets, 100%. And a lot of those rat parts are being fed up in the machine. They're okay. likely ending up in your, I know it's gross, likely ended up in your grains and your rice and stuff because they can't filter out all those parts or small particles. So it's disgusting, it's sad, and it's out there. And I, I either they don't want to see it or they just don't know about it, but there are more animals killed for the vegan diet than the animal-based diet alone. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time, so I'm yes. just going to stop the recording. Again, Nicole, thank you so much. That was amazing. Remember to save the chat. <laughs>